Um, and I think that was quite a wake-up call for a lot of people in the technology industry because they suddenly realized, in fact, that the thing we built, if we're talking about you know, big cyberspace with all these things we do in cyberspace, it's not as robust as we think and it's full of um, holes and, and sort of fix-its and it doesn't quite work. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So um, welcome to the show, Keith. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, it's extreme times. Tell us how, how, how have you been coping with these uh, sort of unusual times? Uh, just about coping, but it's it's very strange. Um, I think it's just getting used to having everyone in the house, getting used to everything being online. Um, and when the sun was shining, I was loving it, sitting out in the back garden. But but today, <laughs> I've been driven indoors. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think today is just like a reality check for all of us. It is, yeah, definitely. Um, so you you're an expert in cryptography. Um, and I really want to get into sort of uh the nuances of cryptography and sort of an, an explanation of what it is. But before I do, um, I want to know how you actually got into cryptography. What, what drove you down that route? Uh, I was a mathematician, so I studied uh, maths at university. Um, and in mathematics, there's sort of two flavors. There's, a, there's maths, which is pure, which I really liked. It's uh, every, everything's explained, everything follows logically. Um, and there's maths that's applied which is the kind of maths you use in physics and engineering. And I kind of hated that stuff. Not, not because I didn't like the idea of maths being useful, but I just didn't like the maths. Mm -hmm. um, and I was torn between these two things because I wanted, I wanted the idea of using maths and making it useful, but I didn't really like the types of maths which fell in that category. And then towards the end of my degree, I discovered um, the maths of communications, which was uh, used the nice maths but it was actually useful. And through that, I discovered um, cryptography, which falls mm -hmm. in that category. Um, and yeah, that was that was the journey, basically. I wanted my maths to be useful, but I wanted my maths to be nice. <laughs> and and I, I mean, I, I can completely understand. Um, and so what is it about cryptography and, and the, that sort of, it, as a field, what is it that um, captured you besides the maths? I think I was... A, well, this was late 80s, early 90s, and I was very captured by the fact that it was something on the rise. It was something that was going to be useful. Um, and we, I remember we would begin our research papers with, uh, you know, in the coming years, we're going to see more and more use of, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And I, I like the idea this was something which was on the rise. Um, and of course, now it's been established for several decades but mm -hmm. it was that idea of you know an, a thing that's whose time has come mm -hmm. and is it so so in in general in general terms can you sort of break down what what cryptography actually is yeah sure i mean it, it is at its core an application of mathematics but what it's really doing is i suppose creating a, a toolkit if you like of, of different sort of mathematical techniques which can then be applied to provide what I would say were core security services. So a classic example of what I mean by that is the ability to keep information secret in a way that you know only designated parties can understand it. That's a service we'd call confidentiality. But cryptography also provides you know, other services. There's one called integrity, which is the ability to detect if information has been altered in transit. Mm -hmm. so, so the idea really is that information is going to pass through dangerous environments, such as the internet or communication channels. It could be modified. It could be observed. And if you want it to be kept secure, you're going to need to do something, apply some techniques to that information to provide protection. And I guess cryptography is the set of tools that you can apply to provide these security services. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so do you, do you feel as though cryptography is, is sort of one of these um, areas in, in especially the te- technology world that is constantly going through, um, you know, massive evolutions or, or is it have we sort of hit a pinnacle at the, at the moment and it's kind of like stagnated in terms of development? Uh, I think probably neither. <laughs> I think it's not going through. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't transform itself dramatically. It moves forward in sort of increments because uh, basically what we want from cryptography stays fairly static. We, we we want information to be protected so people can't see it. We want to make sure we can't change information. We want to know where information has come from. Um, so it doesn't need revolutions, uh, but on the other hand, things are always improving. Things are being fine-tuned. We've got particular new requirements come along, and we need to tweak the tools or perhaps design new tools. So it, it moves along at quite a steady pace. But I, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's so crazy that it gets out of control because what we tend to do is identify a tool, design a tool for a purpose, we design it to be good design it to be long lasting and then we tend to use that tool for quite a long time mm-hmm. so there's, there's no need for it to be constantly ever um, so evolving i mean if you think about that if you put some kind of cryptographic mechanism in the banking networks mm-hmm. then it's going to be very very difficult to change that so so it's got to be something which is uh, around for a long time so mm-hmm. so it's kind of between these two visions that you you portrayed it's always on the move but it it, it it's not crazily uh, fast in the so in the it's just evolves. i mean it's, it, it, as you said it's constantly being fine-tuned as opposed to quite like mm-hmm. going through massive changes yeah i think that's probably fair um <clears throat> with i mean you sort of mentioned that it starts off uh the the theory behind it is that you know information travels through these dangerous um environments and so how much of crypto- cryptography um, started off with sort of government agencies and, and, and the government and the need to keep secrets? I think its origins very much are in that category. I and mean, if you look back through history, because cryptography is not a 20th century invention. I mean, it's been used for millennia. Um, but the, the, the users of cryptography and it's particularly keeping secrets have traditionally been those in power. So it's been military it has been government. It's not something the ordinary user used very much. Um, if we go back through history, you'll see people like Julius Caesar, and Napoleon, Mary Queen of Scots. They're all sort of famous users of encryption, and they were all people with you know, political power who were uh, who, who had enemies basically, and who were trying to achieve things. So I think that the thing that's really changed all of that has been the move. And the development of computers and the fact that everybody starts using and communicating in environments where there is potential for that information to be altered, but also the potential for that information to matter to us. Because, because prior to computers, we I guess we wrote letters, we stored stuff in locked boxes. You know, we, we didn't need special mathematical techniques to protect information. The only users of sort of remote communications were military governments. Um, but that's all changed now. We're all we're all using it all the time. And so th- that sort of shift from you know the 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 uh, kind of upper echelons of power into a more commercial use um, has that does that have any dangers in it? Um, given that you know the average person isn't you know well versed in cryptography, um, is it a dangerous place or or are these commercial companies who are selling these, for example, the phones and, and software and, and what have you, are they doing enough to make the individual um, or keep the individual secure? Yeah, well, there's multiple questions there. <laughs> I think the uh, um, some, well, okay, so your first question was really about uh, are there dangers there for everyone? And I suppose the, the point is really the opposite, that cryptography is there because there are dangers and it's in, it's, it's in there to protect the users mm-hmm. of these products. So... Um, the most early commercial uses would be banks primarily. And of course, cryptography is entering the banking networks to make sure that our finances are protected, that there's no chances of um, amounts being altered, of numbers being changed, of people finding out information they shouldn't see. Um, The first mass consumer use of cryptography is probably mobile phones. And again, cryptography is 
on there to protect both the users and the mobile phone providers, the people who are trying to make money from their networks, to make sure that everything is fair and everything is running appropriately. So I don't think there are dangers. It's the opposite. Cryptography is being provided to protect the ordinary mm -hmm. users against dangers. Um, the second part of your question, are people doing enough? Uh, that's a much bigger question because there's an awful lot of technologies being launched and a lot of products come out there. And there's quite a record of products coming out within you know, lack of security and then security being added as an afterthought because it's not often a big seller. Security is often an overhead. So sometimes the cryptography has had to be upgraded or added later when products went live without sufficient protection. That's quite common among, I say, let's more minor products or, or really new technologies. But but the, the, big, the big users of uh, cryptography, the established ones, built it in from the start mm -hmm. uh, and, and built good cryptography in from the beginning. So I think that the, 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 the thing you're suggesting is probably more applicable today when we're seeing mass consumer electronics, some of which maybe should have some security uh, uh, and some which doesn't have that. So I, I think it's a bigger risk in the sort of mass technology uh, applications. But, but as individuals, do you think, do you think as individuals who, who the average consumer who doesn't have any sort of background in cryptography or sort of cyber security and, and that sort of stuff. Do you think there's, they, they're doing enough to, um, to keep themselves safe because we've seen like a growing number of hacks across all sorts of, you know, um, platforms. Um, so are, are, are we doing enough to protect ourselves or, or is there a, this, this gaping hole in our education? Well, there's two separate issues there, I suppose, because um, there's a bigger question behind the, the thing you just asked there, which is to what extent should it be our responsibility? Because obviously, for a lot of technologies, ideally, uh, uninformed consumer should be able to buy that and be secure mm -hmm. without having to do anything. And that's broadly speaking true for you know banks mobile phones stuff like that i mean the security doesn't require too much action from the user's behalf most of the heavy heavy lifting on security and all the application of the cryptography is behind the scenes and you don't have to make decisions um but uh, you know in general in cyberspace are we doing enough as as individuals probably not because uh the technology can only protect you up to a certain point um and the bigger threat, there's always going to be threats that arise through our uses of um, you know, cyber technologies, which are nothing necessarily to do with cryptography itself. And I think we've all got to develop what I would call a cyber common sense. And some of us don't have that. So the biggest problems are just this. I mean, we make the same mistakes. People, people pick poor passwords or they reuse passwords or they click on links without hesitating and thinking, is it safe to do this? And I think uh, one of the things as a society we've got to develop is a, is a better notion of um, what common sense is when we're operating in cyberspace. So yes, I think there's a big education um, needing done amongst the general population. And to, to an extent, it's happening. I mean, schools mm -hmm. get quite a lot of cybersecurity training. Uh, it might be people like you and me that are a bit in a, uh, more of a problem. We've, we've been through school at a time when we didn't get cybersecurity <laughs> yeah, <true>. education. <laughs> uh, and now we've got to learn it. Uh, and yet we're embracing technologies without perhaps uh, being aware of what we're doing. But no, absolutely. I think that it, there is something for everyone to develop is, is a better sense of uh, what are the common sense security things we should be thinking about in cyberspace. Absolutely. And and uh, I mean, I think the, the reason I ask that is because, you know, in for me personally, I, I see all these like every now and then I see, you know, I'll hear about a particular person I know or like a company online that's been hacked and all these leaks of, of their data has come out. And, and it, it sort of always forces the question is if these, you know, major companies and people who, who have like tons of engineers and thinkers and, and whatnot, couldn't protect themselves, uh, how much can I protect myself? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And, 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 and the answer probably is only to a certain extent. But, but remember, there are two parties to any relationship, if you like. And uh, there's you and the decisions you make. And there's the, the companies and organizations with which you interact. Um, in some cases, you don't have choices. So if you have to register for an online government service and the UK government gets hacked, 
um, that's you're just kind of stuffed. I mean, there's not much mm -hmm. you could have done about that. Um, in a commercial environment, you do have choices. So uh, you could, you, you know, if a big organization gets um, hacked and has made mistakes, there's nothing you could have done about that, but you can choose not to carry on business with them. I mean, if you're going to choose a, a mobile phone provider and one well-known mobile provider keeps having security incidents, you might be well-versed to change your mobile supplier and go with somebody else. So, so that's what terrifies companies. So um, they are very much more mindful now about the reputational issues that, because security is becoming something people make choices about. But on the other end, you know, your end, you, I guess the choices you have are, are really which websites you visit, which companies you do business with. There are little questions you should ask yourself when you're operating online. But you're quite correct that some things are beyond your control. So there's, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of give and take on both sides. And that, that that leads on very nicely to sort of a thought that I have about, um, you know, what what happened in 2016 with the whole crypto wars. Um, and, you know, famously, uh, uh, there was this sort of clash between uh, US government agencies and Apple for um, sort of allowing access. And so in, in that scenario, um, are we sort of, uh, do, do we allow the government too much freedom into our personal lives? Oh, that's a big question. How long is the podcast <laughs> going to last? <laughs> um, the question you're asking there is, is is not about cryptography in general. It's really about encryption. So it's particularly about encryption, okay. which, is, which is the scrambling of information so that other parties cannot see it. And the, and the problem you're correctly flagging is that if you're going to transform information in a way that um, it cannot be viewed, then, of course, if the people transmitting this information are behaving themselves, um, then in fact this is a great thing because you're 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 shutting out, if you like, attackers. Um, but if the two parties using this communication channel are themselves perhaps up to no good, then the problem with encryption is it it prevents law enforcement and national security from observing the traffic. Um, so actually, you've got this kind of double-edged sword when you provide protection. That that it's a great thing so long as good people are using the protection, but it might be seen as a bad thing if bad people are using the protection, if we can even decide who's good and who's bad, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and that problem is actually hardwired into the encryption issue. I mean, you can't have encryption without having that problem. <laughs> and, uh, and I think in some sense, it's an old problem. It's not one that rose in 2016. It's been one that's been around ever since encryption was used, but it's particularly manifesting itself now that everyday users are using encryption technology. So there is a massive question kicking around, which is, uh, what is the right balance? What is the right, is there a trade-off to be made? Or, or, or how do you provide perhaps the ability for, say, national security or the police conducting an investigation to get around protection measures that have been put in place on a device like a mobile phone? Mm -hmm. um, what, what should, how should we do that? Should we just not allow them in and just say we need top security on these devices? Should we give them a way in? If we give them a way in, are we giving them too much freedom? Uh, are, are we making our devices insecure? This is a massive question. And so the Apple um, FBI example you refer to is just one snapshot example of this tension which has arisen in all sorts of different situations. In that particular case, post Edward Snowden's revelations, um, Apple had increased the security on their messaging services. Uh, they'd made it harder to access. Uh, and that was causing problems because law enforcement wanted access. And even Apple had, were saying to them, we can't even give you this access. We've got no way. We've got no way of undoing the encryption we've provided on the mobile phones. And so that's actually a very big issue. We could we could literally talk for weeks <laughs> mm -hmm. on on whether uh, whether Apple should have given them access, whether the encryption was too strong, and it's going to many many different people will have different opinions about where that balance should have have, have lain. But but that's a very good example of this tension which exists on one of the recent pressure points where that where that rose to the fore, um, and in that case, you know, Apple's security was actually very strong. The question was, was it too strong? Mm -hmm. And there's a few sort of issues that, that arise out of um, the answer. And, but primarily, um, just for me personally, because I'm, I'm sort of, my knowledge on this is primitive, what is the difference between uh, the cryptography and encryption? Well, cryptography is 
I'm using that for the broader term. So if you imagine um, cryptography as a toolkit, imagine a little box full of mm -hmm. tools. You've got your screwdrivers, you know, you've got all your different pliers, different tools for different jobs. Um, some of, one of the jobs is encryption. One of okay. the jobs is to to make information, uh, to provide confidentiality, to, to provide secrecy of data mm -hmm. so that only intended recipients can observe that. Encryption tools will be the, the, the tools that are in that toolbox for providing that service. But but that's not everything you want. When you when you log into your bank online, it's not encryption you want. It's the ability for the bank to work out who you are. That's called authentication. Mm -hmm. So there, there are different tools in that in that toolkit box for authentication. Um, when the bank stores all your financial details in a big server somewhere, you want to make sure that nobody changes the amount of money in your account. Well, maybe you'd love it went up, but you certainly don't want to risk the fact <laughs> that it goes down. Um, so there are tools for integrity protection, and there'll be separate tools again that will, will that will raise a flag if that information has been altered in some way. So cryptography is the bigger toolkit. Mm -hmm. Encryption are the tools for providing secrecy, confidentiality. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, I mean, I, I so you you mentioned Ed, Edward Snowden and I and his revelations, and I about a couple of months ago I read his book, and so I couldn't help but noticed the fact that he was so um sort of fixated on the idea that we're not doing enough to encrypt our phones and our laptops and and what have you and i mean famously he he's he's from a long line of you know members of of you know government agencies so he's not he's not like this random spy he's actually a genuine through and through american sort of patriot um and so what 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 was it what was it about his revelations that kind of made him uh, a target um generally well uh, he was a contractor for the national security agency in uh, the us obviously which is the main body responsible for security and particularly data security and i think there are two aspects to what snowden did one was obviously there's a you know raised very interesting ethical issues because he was a, a whistleblower. Now, now obviously in a, in an agency like that, you simply sign a contract saying you you absolutely don't do what Edward Snowden did. So there's a very big question about you know the ethics of what he did, but also he released masses and masses of documents, um, documents which should not have been normally released, um, and that put a huge uh, wad of information into the public space about some of the things the intelligence agencies had been doing, some of the practices they've been following, some of which were you know, questionably legal. Um, and it really just opened up a huge debate because I think it's a bit like, you know, sometimes we feel most annoyed and upset when someone points out something to us that we're doing wrong that we kind of maybe thought was wrong but we kind of decided we, we were hoping nobody would notice yeah. and, I, and, I, and i think in security people have been going along for a few years thinking well we're running we've got this really complicated internet now and we're doing all these things on it and there are so many ways this could go wrong and there are so many things people could be doing to get a, to get access to stuff in this but let's just keep going let's keep building new technologies let's keep networking stuff up and I think the thing that shocked everybody when all these um, revelations came out about what the intelligence agencies were up to was certainly the security experts were not surprised by anything in these revelations. They were just astonished it was all going on. Um, and I think it was quite a shock because everybody sort of thought, oh, I guess we always knew maybe they could be doing that, but they really are doing that. Um, and I think that was quite a wake up call for a lot of people in the technology industry because they suddenly realized, in fact, that the thing we built, if we're talking about a you know, big cyberspace with all these things we do in cyberspace, it's not as robust as we think and it's full of um, holes and and sort of fix it and it doesn't quite work it doesn't work as smoothly as we would like and edward snowden really just reminded us of that and reminded us how fragile the security is in this big cyberspace so in some sense he kind of uh, represented a bigger message um and, and of course then there's the other issue which is of course whether you know uh, someone working at the nsa should tell everybody the secrets of that organization mm -hmm. you know so that i think it's important to separate the man and what he did from the stuff we've learned through his revelations i think in some sense these are two different debates and uh, i mean uh, uh, just uh, uh, on a personal opinion what, what do you feel do you feel like it's necessary to have individuals like that or do you feel do you feel like you know some of this stuff has to it's a necessary evil oh well, <laughs> 
I do have trouble deciding in my own mind uh, because I do think what what he did ethically, I, I would probably not have done, but I, I'm not sure I would have chosen to work for the NSA. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wouldn't have probably wanted to put myself in that difficult position. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with what he did, if you like, but I'm quite, I, I am quite grateful for what he did in one sense, because I think it's quite important that we have broader societal debates about the kinds of things that he triggered. He, so he triggered some very useful discussions. Now, I'm sure people in the government might not agree with that. They'd rather these discussions were not happening. But I think it's actually, he's done a great service by by um, raising a lot of issues and getting some good public debates going. And perhaps we will get some better solutions to this issue long term. Um, so I, in that sense, I think what he did was a, was a good thing. And I think um, we're having much more grown up and mature debates about privacy versus security in, in cyberspace as a result. The actual thing he did makes me a bit uncomfortable, but, but, mm. but, but that's, just the, that's, just, that's just more about me than about these bigger issues. No, I, mean, I mean, personally, until I read his book, I didn't really know much about him. You know, it, it was always kind of painted out to be as if he was kind of some kind of double agent or um, along those lines. But in reality, the way he went about it um, just kind of speaks to, to his, you know, ethical interests in in sort of le- making people know because he famously you know released the information via US media and not you know via some back channels backdoor channels so that's a really uh, sort of one of the things that was striking to me but i want to move on to um i want to move on to 5G um and it's really a hot topic right now um given the whole you know all these debates that are coming up um about about a number of issues, but let's start off with you know this um, the, sort of these these uh, conspiracy theories about five G um, playing a, playing a part in in coronavirus. Um, so, what is five G? Let's let's start there. Well, I suppose uh, I mean it's an interesting cryptographic technology because because obviously mobile telecommunications, as I mentioned earlier, are the first time we've got mass market cryptographic tools in your pocket. So. Mobile phones are, I think, have been a massive technology for society. They've changed the way we do absolutely everything. And, and I mean, I, I recently interviewed one of the founders of the, 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 the security group that I worked for at Royal Holloway, University of London. That was back in the you know, 30 years ago, in fact, when the group was founded. And I asked him over the 30 years what was the most significant thing he thinks had happened in terms of security and cyberspace and technology. And he said, undoubtedly, the mobile phones. He says, I just can't, I could never have imagined a powerful computer in your pocket the way we have them today in 2020. So uh, mobile phones have gone through various evolutions and and the the evolutions are just a number followed by G. So 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. And they're just the phased evolution if you like of mobile telecommunications so and each of these phases has sort of represented a a kind of shift in the scale and the power of uh, mobile telecoms um and they that's traditionally uh shifted with the applications that we imagined mobile telecoms are going to be used for so for example 2g very much mobile telecoms were for making phone calls um, so 2G mobile phones and the networks they were provided were all about making calls while you were on the move. The shift to 3G represented the fact that we were actually starting to do data on mobile phones. We were going to want to access the internet. We were going to send, you know, you know we, wanted, we wanted to exchange data as well as make calls. 4G is kind of the next step up from that, which is not just now we're not we're not just changing we're not exchanging data now we're exchanging a lot of data. Mm-hmm. We might want to watch a football game. We might want to um, listen to a podcast. By, <laughs> we yeah. might want to, we might want to do streaming. Um, we are actually putting much more data demands on these things. It, it's not it's not it's not accessing the web anymore. It's doing serious stuff on these mobile phones. And 5G is just going to be the next. It's just the next iteration. Um, and I think 5G is more about uh, a lot of the things, the, the different networks that exist at the moment supporting cyberspace are all going to be you know, supported by these mass 5G communication networks. So 4G is still very much about mobile phones in your pocket doing lots of things. But 5G is going to be about not just mobile phones doing stuff, but but all sorts of things using the mobile networks, including industrial equipment, including small sensor devices in your home, 
it's very much more about you know massive increases in data being exchanged over mobile networks, but also a, a much greater diversity of devices using okay. these things. So it's kind of the next step up, if you like, from from it being about just about phones. So it's it's just an, an a sort of an, an increase in in the quantity and the types of data that's coming through. Quantity and quality, and and also of the network of of the 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 the, the technologies that are connected to these networks. Mm -hmm. I mean, a four G network is still really mobile phones connecting to masts, uh, people making calls, people accessing services on their phones. Five G is going to be many many more kinds of devices in these networks. And so, what I mean, the obviously, how how does that sort of change the experience for the individual person? Probably not very much. I mean, I mean, when the experience is not, uh, it's not really 5G that's changing the experience. 5G is just the networking technology supporting um, uh, changes that we're seeing anyway in, in terms of technology. So we're seeing, I mean, it, it's capturing various trends. I mean, for example, the last 10 years, a lot of computers have been getting smaller. Computers are becoming more embedded. You're getting sort of what we call the Internet of Things, IoT. Mm -hmm which means that you know, you're getting lots of consumer electronics. I've got electronics in them. That's one trend. Another trend we're seeing is the move to the cloud services. So the fact that you don't yeah. store data locally, you store data in central servers and you access that data. Um, we've also seen um, much more of an integration and, uh, between uh, uh, you know, sort of factories, power stations, just backbone infrastructure becoming connected to the internet. So things that were not connected to the internet before are connected to the internet. Cars are going to become computers connected to the internet. Um, and so, these, so 5G is just one of the supporting um, mobile networking technologies that's evolving to handle these trends that we're seeing in society so mm -hmm. so these are kind of it's not that 5g is going to change our lives 5g is uh, facilitating and, and supporting changes we're sort of seeing anyway and it, it's the mobile part of that picture mm -hmm. and now obviously i just want to go on briefly to this you know these rumors that have been going around and, and they've been proliferating at an, an alarming rate about you know 5g having a role in you know like having a role in the pandemic and, and that sort of stuff. How much substance does any of that kind of stuff hold? That sounds like complete bonkers to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, no, I don't think it's anything to do with 5G. I mean, you could, I mean, conspiracy theorists still worry about the safety of mobile phones. I mean, there, there's still conspiracy theories around going mobile phones are bad for it might interfere with your brain and stuff like that. And actually, you know, maybe the, I'm not an expert on that and, and, and I'm not sure there's enough evidence one way or the other. I think everybody knows if you sit and hold a mobile phone to your head for long enough, you start not feeling great. So, so clearly, they're not things you should have stuck next to your ear for hours on end. Um, but I don't think, uh, yeah, I think the stuff we're hearing about 5G at the moment is, just sounds crazy to me. It's yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 suppose, I suppose when anyone stops to think of it, you know, like all burning down or breaking a, a 5G mast, all, all that's going to do is, <laughs> is just slow down the... The development, but um, there's this important issue for me that I, I've sort of kind of paid attention to, um, and it's the fact that there's 5G has always, um, from from what I've been reading in financial newspapers and, and and newspapers in general, is that it always seems to pop up next to China, China, right, okay. <laughs> China. So what is it about? Is it China that has developed this technology or, or this networking technology um, faster or, or have, have more capabilities? No, I don't think so. I think it's just, uh, it, well, it's, it's capturing a positive thing, really. I mean, the mobile, the, when the mobile sector first came out, it was very divided. So there was a, there were, there were, there were, so there were coalitions of countries, Europe and some other countries around the world developed one type of technology the u.s developed another you know china is separate i think one of the things that's happened to allow us to have better integration is that with the you know 4g 3g and particularly 4g uh, there's been much more uh, evolution of global standards and so mm -hmm. so so everyone's been developing stuff together uh, and because we've all been using the same systems then there's been much more market movement and so we have seen in the uk for example and around the world chinese companies starting to enter and sell cell phones, um, sell network services to us. And so if obviously you, you can buy a Chinese phone um, and you can you can even get your mobile provided to you by a Chinese 
uh, owned provider. Now that was not the case in the past. So, so it's a global market with global technologies playing mm-hmm. a role. And so, so that's just the same for 5G. When 5G comes along, there are now bigger players around the world from different countries, and China's a big player. Um, mm-hmm. And the technologies we're going to use are the same technologies China's going to use. So, so, uh, so China offers services just as we offer China services. And so, so the the debates that have been in the media have really been about. Uh, you know, this so should is it safe for the UK government to have Chinese technology companies mm-hmm. providing infrastructure services networking support in the UK and and that's a political question it's yeah just, yeah absolutely so it's not a Chinese technology it's just that um, China probably are providing quite competitive and and, and value for money. Uh, service offerings, which are very tempting to a cash-strapped government, so so actually it's probably it's probably a reasonable accounting decision. Should we go with this service from China, which looks good value for money, versus is there a security risk? Mm-hmm. Um, you, should, you should be asking the same question of American companies, of German companies. I mean, it's uh, no Absolutely. different. I mean, uh, I think it's it, it works. It works with any any country generally, um, mm-hmm. and and that you raise a very important point where it's it's sort of this accounting versus political issue um and and it's it's one that obviously the government has to take into consideration given that you know it has to keep national interest at, at um at top of mind but generally uh, i mean to me it just sounds like a lot of scaremongering happening um towards china but obviously there are bigger issues there um with with your sort of um so you you've you're in the process of writing a book or you or you, have you completed it yet? no there's a, I, I have a book coming out in a couple of months on on cryptography yeah and and so uh, t- tell us a bit about the book what, what what's what's uh, different about this book than than the textbook that you've written before yeah well I, uh, yeah i wrote a i mean obviously we teach a big masters course in information security at royal holloway and, and i wrote a book to support the cryptographic component of that because we mm-hmm. don't uh, cryptography is a, a math subject, but our students are not mathematicians. So we needed a book about what cryptography does and how you use it and you know, 5G, 4G, 3G, all that stuff uh, that, that didn't really deal with the maths. It more dealt with how cryptography was used. But that's uh, that's really for sort of professionals or people who are training to be professionals. And I think uh, particularly with Edward Snowden's um, revelations and all the discussions subsequently in the media and, and the kind of discussions we've been having um, this morning, um, I realized that there was much more interest in the wider public space and, and maybe a lot of misunderstandings as well about what cryptography was, what it did, why it was important, um, why things like Edward Snowden was was interesting. Um, and I, I, I wanted that to be a, a kind of book a journalist could pick up, a, a, a member of the public could pick up at an airport maybe, um, someone who'd heard about this and was trying to under, get their head around it a bit more uh, and, and also, I suppose, because cryptography underpins our security in cyberspace, um, you, and you asked a question you know, earlier about you know, what does that matter for us? Should we be doing different stuff? Um, I, I sort of thought that people should understand how cryptography supports their daily lives a little bit. So I, so I guess the idea behind writing a book there, uh, on, on cryptography for a more of a mass market was to help people through understanding what cryptography does to feel a little bit more secure themselves in cyberspace but also to help them make sense of some of the the big issues you've just been asking about you know like um, you know 5g in china i mean i don't talk about that explicitly but the, the politics that lie behind mm-hmm. uh, and particularly the, you know, the snowden and, and should we care should we worry what why were apple and fbi having an argument about cryptography because they were um why does that matter so so it was really to try and um yeah to try and have that discussion and have and provide something which helped inform i guess more of a general a general user general reader but also people who are making decisions like politicians and people who are writing and communicating like yourself mm-hmm. and like report like reporters yeah and, and that's very interesting um in to to sort of address cryptography in in that aspect because i don't think I mean, personally, I've I've really been interested in 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 understanding more about it. Um, but generally, I haven't really found a text that is um, that addresses these issues in that way. Um, besides, obviously, the Snowden book. Um, mm. And so, do you in in the book do you uh, sort of explore how, or or prescribe any any tools or any kind of um, measures that the average person can take to to 
protect themselves or is it more of a general overview? Uh, well, I suppose I'm trying to get them to think more about security. So I think if you try and understand what cryptography does, which is what the book tries to explain, uh, it, it, then you understand a bit more about what's going on and what security questions you should be asking when you're in cyberspace. So so rather than sort of sitting and just di di dictating a lot of safety measures you should be doing, I think there's no need to do that because there's some fantastic information out there already in the public space. I thoroughly recommend, you know, Get Safe Online, for example, which is the, uh, a, a portal on the web which will give you lots of good practical advice as to what you could do yourself um, about you know, you know, security practices in cyberspace. What I'm trying to do is make people understand why a lot of that advice is being given. So mm -hmm. get, get, get safe online. We'll say things like, you know, make sure your password's complicated. Don't use the same password on different websites. What I'm trying to do in the book is explain what passwords are actually trying to do, why they're very limited in their capability, why the bank's giving you a better technique for getting onto the, the online banking than, a, than just a password, and, and trying to get people to understand these sort of controls maybe at a slightly deeper level without having to do any maths. I mean, mm -hmm. the, book has, the book has no equations. It doesn't have any diagrams. So it's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not that kind of a book. <laughs> so, so it's a very, very much designed for uh, as a sort of a popular science book. Yes, that's where I would expect to find it on the shelf, yeah. Excellent, excellent. And, um, and so uh, I sort of want to ask, you, I know you mentioned Get Safe Online. Are there sort of any steps that, that the average person can take um besides you know the 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 basic advice of like not having the same passwords and, and stuff like that like are are there any things that they can do like for example i or and many people that i know use laptops that store their store the passwords for different sort of especially mac mac does this uh, you know constantly asking you join me to save the password and and i i always sort of ask myself is this safe and i don't know the answer to it well, it's about it's you've, you've got to go through a risk analysis process. I mean, this is what organizations do. They have risk management processes and you've got to I mean, you do that yourself extensively. You go out into the street, you're making risk decisions all the time. You know, should I cross the road now? You know, should should I should I should I should I drive this road, go this road? You know, should I you know, these are all decisions we're used to making in the physical world. We've got to get in the habit of just thinking a bit more about what risk decisions we should be taking in cyberspace. So, so when you ask yourself questions like this, you should be really trying to think: what am what what am I really what am I worried about? Why why would what, what might the consequences of this decision be? So, so if you decide, I mean, you look at your laptop and you decide to store some passwords on it, and it says, "Do you want me to remember this?" And you go, "Sure, that'd be really convenient." Um, then you've got to, I suppose, you've got to think: how likely is it someone's going to pinch my laptop? How likely is it someone might I get some some malware on my laptop that so an attacker can control my laptop? You know, is that likely? Um, and what would happen if it did? Um, and I suppose you maybe one of the things you need to do is rank in your mind certain key certain things that are really important versus things that might be less important. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean this is this is common advice on passwords, for example, that you should have safe rubbish passwords if you like or good enough passwords not rubbish ones but good enough ones for for stuff that doesn't really matter but make sure they're different from the things that really matter like accessing your personal files or accessing mm -hmm. your bank stuff like that so it might be you make a decision i'm not saying you've got to make your own decisions but you might decide you know certainly your banking stuff you certainly don't want to have the the laptop remembering <laughs> um because uh because if someone broke into your computer or then then obviously they, they, they would be able to access your banks you've got to make sure you're not storing and making all that kind of stuff easy but if you're just accessing some website where it's asked you to register and the only reason it's asked you to register is because basically it wants to track your data and make sure it recommends, you know, it make sure it knows every time you log in, so it can build a little profile of you. Then actually, it, maybe it doesn't matter if the computer remembers that that password, um, so long as that password is completely different to the one that you mm -hmm. use for the really important stuff. So, so you've got to just start thinking a little bit: why is there a password, for example, at all mm -hmm. for this particular use when I'm in cyberspace? And does it really matter? And I think you can safely save some passwords if they're not very important. But so long as they're not the same ones as the ones that are very important, so that, that, that's I'm, very interesting yeah. because I've I've never considered it from that that perspective of asking why is there a password here and and sort of ranking them in terms of order of importance. It's kind of to me it's always been a structural thing. Like uh, there's a password here, I have to kind of 
find a, a create a password or, or well, well I, th I think the thing to do there is when you're asked to create a password ask yourself why um and you know there are quite a few points i will just then turn away from a website as soon as it says i want i've got to register and put a password and i think i'll oh, forget it I'm not, I, don't, I don't want this um but on the other hand i'm thinking why are they doing this uh, do i actually want this because i want to get into that website often enough and i'll want to return um and then you've got to kind of just try and understand why they're doing that because mm -hmm. it, it, they probably won't tell you but in, in most cases they're trying to get marketing material to you or they, or they, or they, or they want to profile you and, and maybe you just don't need that hassle or maybe you don't care and so we can yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just absolutely. register just go ahead no it's really really uh, uh, it's, it's really insightful to sort of consider it from that angle um so i just wanted to sort of leave with um with uh, advice for anyone that's looking to get into cryptography um where what kind of advice would you give them where would they start um what, what kind of stuff to look at uh, well, there's lots of stuff online. I mean, obviously, a great place to start would be a book that I've just written, as we talked about, because <laughs> mm -hmm. that's meant to be a start. But uh, but in terms, it depends what your interests are. If you're if you just like the, um, the the if you just like puzzle solving and stuff like that, then there's lots of stuff on the web. People can go and play with encryption puzzles. Simon Singh has a great website, which has lots of things you can try and crack and break. But but uh, um, in terms of what cryptography is used for. Uh, then obviously because it's underpinning cybersecurity, then then I think get, getting yourself to as a, using it as a way of beginning to get into cybersecurity is quite a good access point for that. When we see a lot of kids, um, at, you know, we we get invited into schools quite often to go and give talks about security, and we will often choose to talk about cryptography because it's got a compelling history. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's got a it's kind of cool, and it gets them thinking about cybersecurity. So there's lots of resources um, out there for that. Um, in terms of someone trying to get into cybersecurity more as a profession, uh, uh, someone thinking about career decisions, there's a lot of programs run by the government now. There's a program called Cyber First which runs um, sort of weekly summer schools, which are designed to try and show kids that uh, you know, cyber security is a, a, a profession they could follow. And they're quite good sort of, uh, they're quite good programs to go on to learn a bit more about, about that. Um, someone a bit at a later stage looking to get into cyber security, there's lots of courses you can go on. There's uh, MOOCs, online courses on the web, but there's also lots of um, you know, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees. So, so there's lots of training options as well if you want to go into education. Um, and someone generally reading about stuff. Uh, yeah, well, I guess I wrote a book for that purpose. Yeah, <laughs> that, was my, so, that was my contribution. Just, uh, um, but there's a, lot, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot. Yeah, of stuff. I mean, the, so the, the book is coming out in, in two, two months, right? Uh, in UK, it will be in June. Yeah. In June. Yeah, and, and the book is called Cryptography, The Key to Digital Security, How It Works and Why It Matters. So that's it. And um, we'll definitely, uh, we'll, so we'll add a link to um, the video. Uh, where can people find you online? Uh, I've got a website, which I can pass you the link to. Um, yeah. They can also, they, they, I mean, the best way is, the best way to get me is email, really. So email or the web. So I can I can get these contacts over to you. Yeah, if you get them over to me, we'll, we'll link them to the video and, and on the podcast. Um, uh, that's, um, it's a, it's a pl pleasure and a privilege speaking to you. Um, I mean, do you have any last words of advice or any kind of book recommendations? Of course, your book. Um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I think, uh, no, the piece of advice for everyone is to get themselves cyber aware, really. I mean, not it's not it's not a case of trying. You know, it's not like you have to understand complicated things. Um, understand the basics um, and, 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 and uh, be cautious, I think, in, in cyberspace. I mean, the, it's an absolutely fantastic place with um, it's just amazing what we can do now. Um, mm. And in fact, it's really amazing. We even just think all the things we can do now are normal. Um, and so particularly now, the particular lock-in times that we're experiencing at the moment, we're relying so much on cyberspace. So please enjoy it. Go out and embrace it. Do all these wonderful things. But just be cautious. Uh, don't be naive. And I think uh, get uh, find out the questions you should be asking uh, before you go off and visit strange places and um, and just be sensible. And, and, and then you can really reap the benefits so cyberspace is not a, it is a dangerous place but then so is the high street so yeah exactly a little bit of common sense goes an awful long way absolutely that's fantastic advice um well i've really appreciated having you on 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 the show um it's, it's a privilege and we definitely hope to have you on uh you know closer to the release of the book
All right. <laughs> enjoy, All right. Very enjoyable talking to you. Yeah. All right. Everyone. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute whatever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.